Mark Watts, EliteFTS.com. I'm here at 11 Athletics in Columbus, Ohio, and this is going to be part one of our sports performance coach education series. And this week we're going to talk about uh, securing a job in the strength and conditioning field. And anytime that uh, I try to write an article or a blog post or do any kind of video, uh, the one thing I want to do is make sure uh, that we do three things. Number one, uh, make sure we explain what the dilemma is, what the issue is. Uh, strength and conditioning is a field that a lot of people want to get into, but it's a very tough field uh, to do so. So uh, it's one of those things that uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're giving you the, the, the skills uh, and some of the methods, some of the techniques, and, so, and, and really try to uh, give you a plan to get into that. Uh, number two, why am I qualified to talk about this? Um, I've been able to have uh, an extensive internship program and coordinate athletes from uh, a number of schools uh, when I during my coaching career. And also, I've been able to see some of the mistakes that some of the applicants have made, some of the interns have made uh, when they're pursuing other jobs beyond uh, the internship they were with me. So uh, I've had that little bit of experience that can help. And then finally, uh, the takeaway points, and again, trying to get you uh, to, to make maybe uh, streamline your efforts to make sure that you're doing the best uh, job that you can to, to secure the job that, that, that you want. So uh, hopefully this, this series will help you with that. Um, so uh, going through... Hopefully we'll have cooperation with technology, but again, uh, the first thing you have to do is make sure that this is really what you want as a strength and conditioning coach. Do you really want to be a strength coach? And uh, a couple of things that, that really are alarming to people when they start to get into the profession is number one, uh, the state of the profession and, and the biggest thing that uh, really uh, keeps coaches from, good coaches from getting jobs is that there are way more strength and conditioning coaches than there are strength and conditioning jobs. That's just how it is. I think that, uh, that supply and demand is just simple numbers. Um, every position that is open, the amount of applicants for that position uh, is just overwhelming. So that's one thing that works against strength coaches a lot of times, that just knowing that is, is a help. Uh, job security, uh, again, one thing you have to understand is that your job can be tied into uh, a sport coach's performance uh, with their athletes and your job security, your means of feeding your family and supporting yourself uh, are directly tied into the performance of 18 to 20 year olds. And I think that's something you have to make sure that you understand, especially at the college, at the college realm. The higher you go up uh, in the profession, obviously, uh, the less job security there is. I mean, that's, most people understand that. So it's just something you have to understand uh, when you're pursuing those top end jobs uh, and as far as level is concerned. That's something you really have to think about. And lastly, the career longevity. Uh, this is something that you know we've heard uh, several times at uh, CSCCA roundtables and NSCA roundtables. And I don't know if it was uh, Tim Belts uh, from Pitt, Pittsburgh or um, uh, Todd Hammer, but I'll give credit to a Pittsburgh guy regardless. Uh, but how many coaches do you know that have retired as strength coaches? It just doesn't happen. Uh, you know, it's it's one of those professions where most either get out uh, because they are you know they, they get burnt out or they can't you know pursue it uh, any longer or uh, they get fired for whatever reason and you know it's that that cycle and, and I think there's a lot of coaches a lot of really good coaches uh, are out of the game uh, for no other reason than uh, not maybe just their performance but for, for for other things so. All right, so a couple critical questions I think you have to ask yourself uh, when you're going through this journey is, number one, you have to make sure that this is really what you want. And uh, the first question is, do you have enough information to make an educated guess as far as if this is really what you want to pursue? There's going to be a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy put in uh, to this career uh, aspirations that you're going to go through uh, and you have to make sure that's really what you want. Uh, have you been able to either uh, shadow or interview or observe a uh, strength and conditioning coach? Have you had interactions with some of those strength coaches and see again what the grind is like and what they're, they have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, there's a lot of coaches that put their uh, put their family through a lot of uh, hardship and, and, and really you know sacrifice a lot of time and energy uh, to pursue a career when they forgot that might not be what they really want. So that's one thing to really think about. Um, yeah, Coach Adam Fight had talked about the three L's and again it's the logo and, and, and really that pursuit of you know trying to get to that you know that, that big time university. And I remember when I was a coach, again, when I would have, when I was at West Point, I'd have the Army logo. Uh, all of you boys wanted to talk to me. As soon as, you know, I, I was at a Division three school, uh, people would ask, where's Denison? 
Uh, I'm the same coach. I probably have more experience, but uh, people want to aspire to, to what that logo is on their shirt, and I think it's, it's some kind of sometimes a mistake because they get uh, they get caught up in that whole uh, whole pursuit. Uh, the second was location. You know, I want to uh, be able to. Uh, coach some more where I don't have to move my family across the country and again that really limits you uh, and then the other one is that lost and, and, and Coach Fida talked about you know just that passion for coaching at a certain university. I call it the passion of uh, someone that really loves working out and they really love you know exercise and training so much that they want to be a strength coach. Um, well it, it's kind of a silly uh, reason uh, to do that. Um, you know it's really you know, don't become a strength coach because you love training. Become a strength coach because you love coaching. Um, it's one of those one of those dichotomies that uh, people just really get. They think that one ties into the other, and getting people strong and being strong are two different things. Uh, being strong feeds your ego, and getting others strong can feed your family. Is, is one thing that I've, I've said in the past, and, and I think it's true. Make sure that you love coaching, not necessarily love training, because again, they're not one and the same. Your 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 your, your windows of training are, are very slow, you know few and, and far between. Uh, between you know again uh, you know their schedule that you have, and then uh, again a couple other things. Uh, number one, uh, geographical restrictions. Um, you know make sure that uh, you know. That, that you're able to uh, move uh, anywhere in the country. The more places you can move, the, the better chance you're going to get of securing that internship, that GA, that full-time position. Uh, questions of convenience. This is one thing I always talk in a joking manner, but um, if you really like sleep and you really, um, you know, and you really like to have, you know, money, uh, it's, you know, it's one of those professions. I'm not saying there's not coaches out there that can support themselves. There's a lot of coaches that's making you know six digits all the way up until maybe a half million dollars a year, but those are a very select few, and they put in decades of time and effort uh, and, and 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 experience to get to that point. Um, but again, starting out is one of those professions that you're not going to have a lot of free time. You're not going to have a lot of uh, uh, spare change uh, in your pockets as well. So make sure again you're not one of those. Uh, you know, people that really, that's really important to you, uh, you have to maybe, you know, it's a different kind of, a, a different kind of scenario. Uh, and again, realistic qualifications. This is something that really hurts a lot of young coaches. They get their, their, their degree, uh, they have a bachelor's, they get certified, all of a sudden they feel they're qualified to coach. Um, one thing I have to understand is that what would separate you from the other tens of thousands of, of recent college graduates over the last several years that makes you more special with no experience to get that position. That's something you have to ask yourself. So again, make sure you understand uh, that, that if you don't have any experience and you're um, applying for positions that require a lot of experience, and again, just be realistic with what you're going through. So, a um, couple things, what's holding you back? Um, this is a good question. Again, go through some some of these different, uh, different these four different avenues. Uh, first one is education, and again, I'm not saying that you know people get it, it twisted with the education part of it. And again, um, you know, some people have said, well, just read, you know, if you just read some books on physics and you know. Uh, physiology and biomechanics, you'll be, you know, you'll be just as uh, set up for uh, success. And one thing about education, remember, education is not just uh, just acquiring knowledge, you know, accessing information. It's about being an interpreter of information. It's about being evaluated on how you can apply that information. Uh, and as Dave Tate says, it's your bullshit detector when you see this stuff, um, you know. In, on the internet, uh, that you understand uh, what is you know what is applicable, what's not, and what is has, is sound and what isn't. So uh, that's one thing to really think about. So again, um, if if you're if you're in a position where you don't you're going to a private facility and that's not a requirement, then that's what you have to you have to you have to weigh that out whether those student loans are going to be worth it for you to get that next position. So uh, the next thing is going to be certifications. Now. Um, and going back to education, I know there's been there's been some talk about, um, you know, I've learned more on a weekend certification than I did in a four year degree, and let me I'm going to go through that in a minute. But understand uh, when I talked to Trevor Cash, he was a brilliant brilliant person, and I really enjoyed talking with him. But the difference between exercise science degree and there's a there's a difference between knowing how to exercise and knowing how exercise works, and that's what the degree is for. Knowing how to exercise is just as much on you as it is the curriculum that you're, that you're part of. And again, taking one course in barbell training 
Uh, I don't know too many you know, schools that have a deadlift 101 course that the registrar says, yes, this is a good idea, let's put this through. Uh, let's, let's have these students spend how many, hour, how many amounts of dollars on each credit hour to learn deadlifting 101, where uh, that is up to you as a student to make sure that you're acquiring that experience uh, to get that information. There's a difference between the two, just understand that. Um, that goes back to the certification. Again, just, I understand, people always, I hear it all the time, just because you're certified doesn't mean you're a good coach. Well, everyone knows that, everyone understands that. That's, that's something that, that, that people keep saying that. And I think it's maybe the people that aren't certified that just, that, that you know, basically uh, say that um, to make themselves feel, feel a little more secure. And I'm not saying you have to get certified. But what I am saying is that, you know, that is, you can't put yourself in a position where you don't get a job because they require a certification. Listen, a certification just gets you to the point where you can, you understand the basics and you're not going to put any of your athletes or clients in danger. It doesn't mean you're a good coach. Everyone knows that. No one's saying that. It's frustrating when people criticize that. No one's saying that. Uh, what you have to understand is that, you know, what I see if someone is certified or someone's working towards certification, that means that they're not lazy and they do care and they understand what they have to do to get the bare basics. So again, uh, if, it's, if, if you're in a private setting and you're looking at, a, at, a, at, a, at a, an affiliate or a private gym somewhere and they don't require it, then I can't tell you to get it that's going to that's gonna help you either, either, either good or bad. But... You know, it's one of those things. Don't make that a limiting factor if you really want to be a strength and conditioning coach, especially at the college level. Now it's required. So you really can't avoid that. Um, so it's one of those things you have to think about. Um, experience, talk about that. Um, if, if you don't have experience, you have to get that experience. You have to, you have to find a way to be experienced. And I know it's that whole uh, different, you know, that, that, that parallel between uh, I can't get a job uh, because I don't have experience and I can't get experience because I don't come out a job. And that's what volunteering is for. That's what internships are for, to get that experience. Um, as, as my friend J.L. Holdsworth always says, why would I bring in somebody with no experience? Why would I pay them if I have to teach them what to do? It doesn't make sense. Um, so that's what the internship is for, to gain that experience. Is it fair that, it's an un that you're pay working all those hours for, for, for just you know, a few t-shirts uh, and, you know, and maybe a, a team meal here or there or some supplements? Uh, no, I'm not saying it is fair, but again, that's, that's what it is. You have to, if that isn't fair to you, then that's when you have to evaluate if this really is the career. Uh, and again, connections. Um, that's one of those things that you know, people, when they talk about clinics, they talk about... Um, you know, conferences and what, you know, whether they're going to learn or whether they're not going to learn. Listen, most of the time when you go to these clinics and conferences and seminars, it's about the people you interact with. It's about the things you learn outside of those presentations that are so important. And again, they're not going to, it's not like they're having a receiving line for these, you know, for these speakers that you're able to, you know, meet every single one. You have to take the initiative to go out of your way uh, to meet them and talk to them. Um, and really put yourself in a situation where they remember who you are. And most of the people at those conferences that will be in a situation where they can hire you are probably in the audience. They're probably with you. They're probably uh, in, in your same situation. So it's important that you have those connections between networking. Get out from out of your desk, get off the internet, and go and see people. Go and bring people uh, to you if you can, and, and make sure that you're, you're making those connections that way too as well. So, all right, so where to look? Uh, when I did a presentation uh, a few years back at the NSCA Coaches Conference, one of the gripes, one of my evaluations was, you didn't tell me where to find an internship. And I'm, you know, and I, I, I'm in a situation where I don't know where I can find you, specifically an internship. I will say there's a couple places that you can get to. So uh, footballscoop.com, cscca.org, and then strengthperformance.com, plus our site, leadfds.com. So every once in a while, we'll, we'll try to put those up or have coaches contact us, um, and you'll want someone to kind of end that uh, forward-thinking realm. Um, but again, those are listed. Uh, the problem is, is that most of those positions that are listed on those sites are not paid. So, you know, that's there's a lot of positions available. They're just, most of them are just, this is an unpaid internship and you know, no monetary compensation will uh, be provided. Um, so they're, they're out there. And, you know, and the second part is, again, you understand is that when, when a coach knows that he has an assistant leaving, he has an idea who he wants to replace him with. 
probably someone in house because they know them, they trust them, um, or they have some they, they have some people in mind. And usually when they do that, and I'll talk about this a little later, when they do the description, it's based on what they're looking for in terms of who they already have in mind. So uh, you know the other thing is when you're looking for okay, I really want to do an internship. For example, this is pretty easy. Um, you look at your geographical, basically that circle. You draw a circle where you can commute to. How many schools can you commute to from where you're living now? Or how many schools can you commute to from where your uh, uncle lives? Uh, or where you, know, you have friends that live? Or where you can stay somewhere? Wherever those schools are at, you need to apply to those schools directly. And again, make sure you know exactly who you're applying to. Uh, as far as the, the, the head strength coach, the director of sports performance, whoever it may be, um, a lot of the smaller schools won't even have a strength and conditioning coach. They might have a football coach at the Division three, uh, Division two levels that, um, you know, just basically they might have a, uh, you know, a couple, you know, coaches at the uh, that small school level that really, you know, they just they, they just make the sport coaches do it, or the athletic trainer has to do it, or they have a fitness center director. So make sure when you're looking at those positions. Make sure, and I'll talk about this in a minute, make sure that situation is right for you. So again, uh, look at those geographic areas. Where can you realistically you know, get to and commute to and be able to volunteer? Um, because again, if you're applying for internships across the country and you have nowhere to stay, that's not really realistic. And you're going to be set up, you're going to have to turn that down even if you get offered it. Uh, and that's the first thing you're going to ask. Can you, the first thing I ask, can you make this work logistically? And that's the one thing that you have to understand. Um, okay, so applying for positions. And again, we'll talk about the, uh, the unpaid internship first. And again, this is, um, I know David Adamson wrote, wrote an article on our site about it. And people get you know, real, uh, they gripe about it. They get a little bit butthurt about, you know, the, uh, you know how could you ask someone to, to, that's the problem with the industry, is that there's too many, you know, un, there, there's too many internships and they're all unpaid. Uh, but that is the industry. And here's my, my question. If, if, you're, if you don't want to do an unpaid internship, and guess what? No one wants to do an unpaid internship. You know that, right? I mean, you're not the only one. But if you don't want to do that internship, you have to ask yourself a couple things if you can't take that. Number one is, do you have other options? Do you have a, a paid internship option that you're able to turn that down? So if the only options you have are unpaid internships, you either take one of those or the one that you're offered, or you don't. And if you don't, do you really want to be a strength and conditioning coach? So that's that's the option. You know, if, if you know, I got offered an unpaid internship, and I, I, I can't afford to take that. Well, then you know, you know that that's what the problem is. You know that that's that's the situation. It's unpaid. You already know that. So uh, looking through, what other options do you have? Um, the other one is just as important. Is again, does it match your experience level? Here's the one conversation that I've had with a couple people is. You know, I've, uh, I've been offered unpaid internships as a strength and conditioning coach, and people say, well, I can't do it if it's not paid. Well, my always response was like, well, listen, if this is a paid internship, I wouldn't be talking to you. I'd be talking to the other 100 people that, that want that same job. So understand is that, you know, when you say, oh, I want a paid internship, well, what makes you, uh, what about the other unpaid interns who have a couple of years of experience. I have former interns that have, you know, they've had five internship experiences and they're still kind of looking. And again, is that on them? I don't know, but that's just the state of it. So if, if really, you have to be realistic about what, again, everybody would like a paid internship. But again, if the option is not a job or that, then you have to be realistic with it. So when you're looking at positions, right, we're going to go ahead and look through, I'm going to start applying for these positions. And for, so the first thing you have to do, I found an internship, I found a, a, a GA position, oh, no. I skipped over, okay. All right, so let's talk about the graduate assistant. Um, when you're looking at a GA position, remember, these are going to be even harder to come by than these, these paid interns or the unpaid internships. Again, most of them are going to be reserved for people that are part of the program. That's just a way for them to reward some of those student athletes that, uh, that, that have played for them that are in that situation. Probably the best situation you can ever be in is a GA position at a small school uh, because you'll get an opportunity to coach. You have, you have some teams that you'll be able to coach, uh, and you'll get your graduate, you'll get your, your, your school paid for. Um, and, and again, it's not as competitive. So that's one thing to think about. Um, and again, can you, if you're going to be somewhere, can you, and you're going to get your master's degree anyway, uh, can you volunteer in the weight room? 
Um, I know some, 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 some people that have, have volunteered uh, during their, 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 their uh, grad school and then they were able to turn that into an actual GA that second year or the third year of their, their graduate study. So, and again, it's one of the things you have to think about. And then again, uh, last thing we'll talk about this as far as when you're looking at applying you know, for positions, looking at the collegiate through high school and through the private sector. Uh, obviously, collegiate is going to be very, very competitive. Uh, you're looking at the high school level with, um, you know, with the high school level, and again, those are few and far between. And the only thing I caution you about is that if you have somebody, a high school coach uh, like Fred Eads or like Gary Schofield, and I'm probably missing hundreds that are that are excellent, uh, do you have somebody you can learn from? And you know, there's going to be some other hoops to jump through with they have unpaid internships at the high school level, you know, with uh, criminal record check and, and, and just you know all the you know the, the uh, you know child abuse clearance and all the, all those different different things. So uh, it's one thing that really just uh, you know that's that's it's not as pro uh, as prevalent right now. And usually, if they do have any kind of stipend money, they usually put that to some of their teachers, some of their coaches to help run the weight room in the off season. So. That's, that's a little bit uh, sketchy. And then, you know, the last thing, that private sector. Um, and again, you know, do you have to jump through as much hoops? Do you have to get in a position where you are able to, um, you know, do you have to be certified? Do you have to have a degree? Uh, I don't know. That's going to be up to that individual. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, you have to know what, you know, I, what is going to be the best for you. So uh, do you have to intern at a private facility? Um, you know, I know some people that do have a pretty extensive internship program. Uh, JL at the spot, for example, does. They do here at the Levin Athletics and, and Anthony Donskoff. I know it's just locally uh, at Donskoff Strength and Conditioning, you have interns. And then that leads into, okay, now we have enough clients that we can actually get you paid. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those situations where do you have to do a full extensive internship? Uh, and again, do I have to intern at a CrossFit facility to be a CrossFit coach? I don't know. If, if you can just get your level one, if you can pay for that, get your level one, aren't you qualified to be a coach now? I don't know. That's, that's your decision. Uh, you know, a situation, could you uh, be in a situation where you intern at, 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 you know, at a place and then all of a sudden they pay for your certification because, again, it's not cheap. That may be a situation that helps. But, again, you have to understand what you're able to do. Here's the last thing I'll say about that is make sure if you want to be a college strength and conditioning coach, make sure it's because you think you have the skill set that will relate to that age group, right? Not because of the logo or not because you want to be big time, not because you want to work with freak athletes, but because you feel you can connect with that age group. You, you feel that your best bet, your best position to motivate athletes and get them better and have them have a fulfilling career is that age group. If not, if that's not the reason you want to be there, you have to rethink it and then you might have some other options that are more viable for you, especially, you know, again, uh, with the military option, which after the, you know, before the cuts was, was just a great deal. Now with, with a lot of those government budget cuts, a lot of those positions uh, that could have been re really uh, a, a kind of a, a back uh, drop for you know, or, or a kind of a way to stay in the profession, some of those are disappearing. I hope they continue to, to grow back up again. So. You found an internship, and now you're in a position where you have to apply for it. You found a GA, you intern, you're going to apply for it. You found a, um, uh, you know, any kind of position, and you're you're in that application process. So I'll go through these. These might seem condescending, but I don't want to. I just want to. I've seen a lot of these. I've made some of these mistakes. So hopefully, this will help you. So first of all, again, when you're doing a cover letter, make sure you have the heading of who you're who you're addressing it to. I know that seems common sense, but uh, sometimes it gets tricky. Uh, make sure that you're addressing it to the director of strength and conditioning or the head of strength and conditioning coach, the person that you are going to be going to be your direct supervisor. Um, you know, I, I sometimes they will have a, a, a contact person as someone in human resources. Uh, if you're going to directly email to them, to, to you know, email them. Uh, sometimes it's an assistant uh, that handles all of the interns. Uh, again, make sure you're addressing it to the right person. Uh, so, and again, it should be someone, either that head strength coach, or if they specifically say an assistant, make sure you address it to them. Um, the four paragraph model is just an easy way because, again, if you're in a situation where you really want to be a strength coach, you're probably going to send a lot of these out. So, the first one that, that I like to, to basically, as far as if you're going to you know, cut it down to four paragraphs, remember, if I'm reading a hundred of these things, right, I, I, I want you to get to the point right now. If I'm the one hired. So, uh, who are you? That's the first paragraph, right? 
I'm so-and-so, um, a senior exercise science major at this university, uh, and I am, you know, who are you and what are you, what are you applying for? I mean, I, I'm, I have a sincere interest in the, um, you know, sports performance intern, you know, position, whatever it may be. Who are you and what are you trying to do? This, I, this you know, express your intention. Uh, the second one is, is um, really, why do you want this position? Why work for this university? Now, you can have a template with these cover letters. But be specific when you go to this second paragraph. Why do you want to work at this university? If it's, if it's a university that you know, doesn't have maybe the greatest academic reputation, don't include that, right? If it's someone that's been 500 in most of their sports, don't talk about ath you know, athletic excellence. Be realistic because, again, they're going to see, they're going to, I can tell right now the, uh, you know, what, what is just a fabricated, just, you know, a, a form type paragraph and what's not. So, uh, again, make sure it's specific. Why do you want that position, right? The third paragraph being, why should they hire you? What makes you separate from the other 100 applicants? So, what have you done? What is your experience? What can you bring to the table, right? And coaches, don't care about your training philosophy because you're not going to be able to implement it anyway, especially as an intern. They want to know, again, are you going to be loyal? Are you going to care about their, 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 their athletes? And I think that's one of the things that we'll talk about in a minute. And then summarize it, which is really a repeat of the first paragraph, right? Uh, thank you. Here's my contact info. Uh, you know, really excited about the possibility. Sum it up and keep it very, uh, very direct, very, very, very quick, concrete. Make sure you include your email. Make sure you include your, your, your cell number. Um, so they can they can get a hold of you that way. Uh, so again, just that's an easy way to kind of split up your cover letter. Uh, the next thing is going to be uh, the resume itself. So um, I've made I've had some terrible resumes. I really have, and I think a lot of it is just because um, I've been in a situation where you know it's um, you know for the most part you know I just I just try to include too much. One page that's what a lot of a lot of coaches want. They want that one page. Um, and again, I don't know if it's a situation where you know you can get away with one page, but um, if you can go one page front and back, that's good. Young coaches, a lot of times you're trying to fill up that page, so I understand that. Um, statement of intent: What are you trying to do? Right? I'm trying to secure a job at a you know at a strength and conditioning coach at a certain school. Be specific. Oh, it is replacing that one line. I would, my sincere interest to, to you know. To, to be employed at such and such university, uh, and again, just that statement of intent. What are you trying to get to? Uh, your professional statement. That's kind of an education thing, you know, for for, for, for teaching a lot of times. But basically, uh, it's a way to maybe summarize your qualifications, right? I have experience with this these schools. I have uh, experience, you know, with with you know anything as far as with helping with nutrition plans with. Um, you know, with, with doing the FMS or, or, or you know, velocity-based training, uh, those, techno those technology-type uh, tasks that are so prevalent now in strength and conditioning that some of those old-school coaches are not used to, being able to, someone, if you understand how to implement some GPS uh, technology in a program, that's going to separate you right there. So, again, just summarize those because, again, that's what people are going to see right now. Um, your relevant experience. And again, I understand if you wrote for the school newspaper, you're the president of your fraternity. I got it. Right? Good. Good job. Uh, I don't know how, you know, working at, as a, as a, as a waiter or waitress um, is going to convince me that you're, um, you know, you're going to be a good strength coach. Although, I do think that a few professions everyone should do would be uh, delivering pizzas and waiting tables uh, and washing dishes. If everybody does, does those three, I think that the, uh, you know, we'll be a, a better society. You, that, that's a very humbling experience. So, all right. So, uh, descriptive language. And again, this is, you know, I have written, you know, an extensive uh, program. I've, I've had a, you know, comprehensive uh, tra training, uh, you know, warm up and whatever it may be. But again, be descriptive if you can. Uh, again, just, you know, don't, I, you know, I've taken athletes through warm ups. I've, you know, Tested athletes on a vertical jump. You know, make sure again that you're uh, not not fabricating, making things you know too over the top. But make sure it's something that people you know a couple different descriptive words can really help with that resume. And then make sure someone proofreads it, and make sure not you, someone else proofreads it, and um, have someone look at it. Have someone have a coach look at it. Uh, and again, it's one of those things that you get some feedback. Nowadays, when applying for these positions, um, most coaches are asking, you know, for you to get a video together. Um, so again, that's one of those things with the videos. 
uh, you know, people say, okay, I need, I need a video of you teaching someone how to squat. Take me through your progression. So be used to that. That's a good thing because, again, I think it's one of, those, one of those aspects that people can get a really good idea, at least how you interact in front of a camera. Because I'm just as nervous talking in front of a camera. I'd probably be talking in front of, you know, you know, 20, 30, 200 people than talking in front of this camera. I'll tell you that right now. But it does give you some experience. It does give them a kind of a it's, – it's your chance to really shine. It really is. So um, references. Ask your permission. Make sure that people – you ask, if can I use you as a reference? That's it. Make sure you do that. The worst thing for a coach is, is to get caught off guard. Uh, next thing is, again, update all your contact info for your references. Uh, and, again, make sure they have your – they if you, if you have someone as a reference, they should have the newest – copy of your resume. Coach, I'm applying for these jobs. Here's a copy of my resume. Because the first thing when someone calls me, hey, can you tell me about so-and-so? I'm like, yes, I'm, where's his resume? Right, because I might not know what you've done after this, this, this. And I want to at least have a familiarity with that. So, um, the other, you know, and again, every time you apply for a position, notify him. It's maybe a text, maybe an email. Say, hey, I apply for this, this, this. You know, or hey, listen, I apply for 15 different jobs. You know, you're probably going to get called with these. And again, uh, at least they have that. Then they can go back to their email and say, okay, oh, I do know someone there, right? They do know someone. So I, when I get a call out of the blue from another coach, I know what it's in reference to. And again, um, you know, you don't ask coaches to call. Hey, do you know anybody there? I get it all the time. Do you know anybody there? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, can, can you make a call? Well, you're one of 200 people. I'm going to call. You know, I, it's one of those things where you have to at least – Get to the position where you're going to get an interview. Then, if you get a phone interview, if you get a direct contact, then go ahead and ask the coach to make a call or shoot a quick email. Um, because again, what happens is there'll be if you if you if you have them call everyone, all your references, call everyone you've ever applied to. Uh, it's it's really going to be it's, they're going to be really sick of doing it, and again, it's not fair to them. So. Okay, uh, last thing about the, the, the references, again, if you don't ask for letters of recommendation unless you are being requested for letters of recommendation. Some, uh, some applicants, you know, applications will require those. You can automatically upload. If you're going to ask for them, ask for a general one. Now, some people don't want to do that. Some, 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 some people want to send it directly to those people. They, want it. they don't want to send you a general one that you can change. Um, some people, for me, I'm going to send you a general one. You, you input whatever position you want to put in there. I'll give you a Word document. Or it's going to be general enough that, hey, I would hire him for whatever position you ask. Uh, so, again, just try to be general and don't ask for, spe for specific positions if you can avoid it. Sometimes you have to, but really, if you can avoid it, try to get some general ones. So, um, the phone interview. Here's the one thing, too, when you're applying for some of these, these positions. If you're applying online, which most large universities, well, most universities in general want it online. So when you apply online, uh, you're going to have to input all this information. You have to get a username and everything else. Uh, and they'll have to upload so that information. So they'll have it. And they have to do that because, again, they have to have a, a checks and balances. A um, couple things. Number one, the supplemental questions, probably the most important part. It's going to be a list of like five to ten questions. They're going to seem very random, but really they're be very general. Uh, and they're not like uh, just checking, you know, just demographics or, you know, they're, they're really ta checking. Uh, do you have this many years of experience in the field? Do you have, uh, are you certified? Do you have a degree in this? And you'll have those just basic general questions. And if you answer no to any of those questions, your application, and this is, this is across the board a lot of times for universities, your application doesn't even get to the people that are going to be reading it that will make the hiring decision. You've essentially eliminated yourself. Now, you can't lie on those things, but at the same time, you know, I've been in a situation where do you have, uh, you, know, you know, three years experience at the university level? Um, well, you know, you can answer yes. It might have been, I was a women's basketball coach, but I would, it's still experience at the university level. So uh, you can maybe, you know, I don't know if that's going to, uh, you know, hurt you in the long run or not, but again, just having that university experience, maybe that's what you're asking. So uh, I don't think, you can't, you can't really fib those. Um, the only other thing is, number two, if you are someone that is referenced or referred, they can request to get your application regardless of what you answer in those. So that's your only next bet. And I know that from, the, from, from an inside source, that's really how it works. So again, those supplemental questions are, are vitally important. And, um, so uh, let's go to the next part. It's going to be the phone interview. So a lot of times, again, a lot of them will ask you to send a video. 
That's the second part, and this kind of some of this applies too. But with the phone interview, they're horrendous. They're awful. They're awkward. No, you can't get any feedback. Uh, I've had a few phone interviews. Some of them were great, great, uh, and I've got job offers and an internship offer off of them. Uh, some of them went terrible because I just I couldn't. You know, I, I just, you know, I don't know what it was. If I'm talking on the phone, I can't talk with my hands, and then I just don't know what to say, I guess. But, but you have to at least get yourself to, in a position where you're not going to be put out of the game by the interview. It's got to be one of those things where it'll, at least it'll get you to the next point. So be with a, with a phone interview, be prepared. Uh, make sure, again, your phone's charged. Make sure you have the computer in front of you. Make sure you know if it's going to be a committee, try to find out who's on a committee first. Sometimes they don't want to tell you, but a lot of times if you can get a little bit of an idea, okay, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be the obviously the strength coach, it's going to be the AD, it's going to be the women's basketball coach, the men's lacrosse coach, uh, and swimming diving coach. Well, at least you have an idea of kind of some of their background. And they don't have to tailor uh, the interview to them, but at least you have a, you're more prepared. Uh, and then you can kind of, and then that way you can address them directly on the phone by name. Uh, I've made that mistake, you know, a couple of times with just, you know, being lost of who am I actually talking to. Uh, so again, it's one of those things that, that that'll help. Um, you know, it take notes what they're saying. You know, again, what questions did they ask you? And I think that's one of those things that you know you should have a list of your basic philosophy. Here's a question you're gonna get: What's your coaching philosophy? Well, I don't know. If you just got a degree and you're trying to get an unpaid internship, you really don't have one yet. But yet they're gonna ask you. So. I think it's important to at least start to think about. And that's the biggest thing about having assistants is that you want them acclimated to your system, but you want them to create their own philosophy as well. So it's one of those times to start to think about what do you really believe in? And you should be able to say that when someone asks you, regardless of your experience. So um, the other thing is, again, follow up. Email and a handwritten note. A handwritten note goes farther than just about anything. It just shows that you care enough to take the time to write things down and say, I appreciate it. It doesn't have to be very long, but again, send it. Take the time and send them a handwritten note thanking them for the interview. Um, you have a timing thing there, so again, they hopefully you'll get it out right away. Get it out right that day, so again, they'll get that fresh and they remember who you are. Uh, that's how you separate yourself. Um, you know, and again, a lot of the questions they'll, 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 that they're going to be asking are, some are theoretical, right? Okay, what is your philosophy on this? What would you do in this situation? Some are experience-based. In your experience, you know, now instead of theoretical, like what would you do in this situation, they want to know, okay, uh, what have you done in this situation? Now, if you don't have a lot of experience, that's a tougher one to do. So you might have to kind of sidetrack a little bit and say, okay, this is a similar situation than what you're asking, but this is what I did. The fact that you at least have the why of why you reacted a certain way or why you addressed the situation a certain way will at least get you in a situation uh, where you'll, uh, you know, not look like a stud starting bumbling idiot, uh, you know, on the phone like I've, I've done in the past. Uh, and again, some of it's conflict oriented. So again, be careful about sensitive topics. So they talk about athletes with eating disorders. They want to know about, you know, the female athlete triad. If you, you know, it, all those different, you know, um, you know, concussion and, and questions that come up. Uh, don't talk out of scope of your practice and make sure you're answering with some, you know, some, some conviction and some compassion. As my, my friend Carl Geiser always says, uh, you know, that will help you uh, in the long run. So, um, key questions when you're applying to this position. And again, um, whether you're going to take a job or not, right? Okay, I applied to this position. Don't ever apply to a position you don't think you're going to take just for experience. You know, everybody says, I want some, I want some interview experience. And interview experience is great. I've learned so much, especially from the jobs I didn't get. But at the same time, you don't want to apply for positions that you, you're not going to get great experience for going through an interview that you're not feeling it anyway. I mean, I've been on, I've been on those, uh, you know, those uh, complimentary interviews uh, where I've been on interviews where they seemed like they were just basically courtesy interviews where all right, I know this guy or he knows this person and let's just bring him in for an interview and at least we get you know I can control that you know um, so don't interview for, for play you're not going to get a good, good experience if you're not your heart's not in it anyway so um, you know is this position if I take this internship or this GA or this full-time position um, you know, I've been a head coach and I'm going to take an assistant position at a school in uh, Nowhere, USA. Uh, is this really going to help me get to where I want to be? And the first step of that is knowing where you want to be. 
Um, so again, if I take an internship at a private sector uh, facility, is that going to help me be a strength and conditioning coach at the college level? I don't know. Most of the time, no. But it, it can't it can't work out for you depending on on, on what the situation is, depending on what your strengths and weaknesses are, right? If you're someone that's just really not very uh, you're, you're you're kind of a meathead power lifter background and you don't have any idea about speed training well go and do an internship at a, at a facility like that might help and vice versa so it's one of those things you have to decide the next one is again why get the evaluated experience remember john maxwell says it's not the experience you know when you have these these certifications that require you have to have so many hours of coaching well you have to have so many hours of coaching with someone watching you Right? I've been, I've been there, I've done that, I've been in a situation where I'm coaching and coaching and no one is ever telling me, hey, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And if you're a coach, especially a young coach, I, every time, I've had, I've had coaches that have helped me say, well, dude, why are you telling them to do that? Or, okay, hey, why do you have this in your program? And just the fact, the more times you can answer the question why, the better coach you're going to be. I guarantee that. Guarantee that. If I have to answer why I'm doing something, the more I do that, the better coach I am. So make sure you're somewhere where you're actually going to evaluate and at the end of the day, someone's going to say, hey, listen, this isn't very effective or you need to work on this because if not, you're not going to ever, you're not going to ever improve as a, as a coach. Third question, uh, can I support myself financially and, uh, or at least have the means to do so? What I mean by that is, uh, you know, if this job doesn't pay, can I at least have a part-time job at least so I can pay my rent? Uh, so again, if it's just not going to work logistically, you know, you have to make that decision. So uh, anywhere you're, you know, and I think coaches will realize if you can get to the point where you have an internship program and you provide housing and maybe give them a meal plan on campus, you will get the best interns in the country. But for some reason, people have not figured that out yet. Um, they, I don't, I don't know what it is, but so... As an intern, you have to anticipate that you're going to have you you have to save money to work for free. Now, no other profession do you really have to do that. And but again, that's what separates strength and conditioning coaches, especially at the college level, I think, uh, than a lot of others. So just understand that. All right. So you get to the interview. All right. Dress like it's a full-time job. Treat this like it's a full-time job, whether it is a full-time job, it's a, a GA position, or it's an unpaid internship. Dress like you're, you're interviewing and on, on a position at Wall Street. Uh, dress to impress. Do not anticipate that it's going to be an athletic, laid-back background. I don't know. Make sure, again, you're dressing uh, as, as, you know, to impress. And again, uh, remembering names is one of those things. I'm terrible at it. A lot of people are. Maybe repeating the name, maybe associating, maybe always looking through, okay, hey, I know who that person is. I would study, if I had an interview somewhere, I would study everybody in the athletic department. Knowing the sec athletic secretary by name, when you say hello to her. Uh, and again, make sure, again, make sure it doesn't get creepy, right? If you know everything about everybody, you know, as soon as you get there. But again, doing your research, you know, when Mark Matlack interviewed at the Allegheny for the head, head football coach when we were assistants, it's the most impressive thing. Um, he was he was a shoe, and first of all, because he cared, he had passion for for Allegheny football. But he also knew that I was a Marine, and when he when he first of the interview, and that was something that separated him from 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 all the other candidates. But um, and again, don't try to press what you know. That's that's the other thing too. Again, I know that uh, you know when 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 you know interns come into a position, and the head coach, listen. Probably know. I heard this from from Mick and Roddy would say to his interns. Listen, I understand you probably have a ton of knowledge, a ton of good ideas. I got it, but you need to just, just, you know, coach these kids up. And and I got your good ideas, but you know, again, they that that's you'll have a time and place for that. That's not what's going to get you those positions. The things that are going to get you is again, am I going to be loyal? And again, do I care about the athletes? Am I going to, you know, again, sweat and, and, and do everything I can to make sure those athletes got everything you need to be successful? Uh, and again, just be able to adapt. The biggest thing is, and again, when I got my first position, you know, I went from Mr. You know, you know, West Side Barbell Technique and then implemented these crazy Olympic lifts in there, and I went to the high intensity capital of the world. The first thing they asked me is, like, why are you doing that? And of course, being a young coach, I couldn't answer. So, but eventually, we got to the point where we we're doing some of Zat Stewart's, you know, dynamic effort methods. We were using some accommodating resistance. Uh, I was the guy to teach Olympic lifts because I had experience into it. 
Uh, but it's one of those things where, you know, I was in a weight room, I, I didn't have any bumpers, you know, so I couldn't do Olympic lifts. So I better be adaptable enough to say, okay, I can do this instead. The other thing is, um, when I go somewhere and you have those, the head coach can have any opinion he wants. If you're in this game for 20, 30 years, you got your opinions, you got your beliefs, you don't have to change. If you're an intern and you, this is your first job, your opinions should change based on what you learn. You sure you know enough to really say, okay, I'm, you know, this is what I believe and I'm not going to, you know, back down from that. To say someone to, to get, you know, you're someone where you're working for someone, they say Olympic lifts have no place in athletic development. A lot of coaches believe that. And then your next position you go to, the next internship or GA you go to, is with someone that all they do is Olympic lifts. What do you tell that coach? No, I'm not doing them. I don't believe in them. You better be adaptive. You better learn them. So I think it's one of those things. Make sure you're adaptive. That's, that's the one thing that will set you apart. I can do all this stuff. Um, and again, really, especially with the technology. I know how to implement some HRV techniques. I know how to use the GPSs. I know I've used velocity-based systems before, and I understand at least how to, uh, you know, set them up, interpret that, or whatnot. So, uh, again, be yourself, right? You can't go back. You know, you can't be someone you're not, and they'll see right through it. And you're just you're just selling yourself out because when you do get that position, all of a sudden you're not the same person you interviewed. And it just you know, do it your way, uh, especially when you start that job because. Uh, again, there's, there's no way that you're ever going to be able, able to go back to it. Um, and then the last thing is follow up, same thing. Make sure, again, you're sending handwritten notes, you're sending emails out. Um, so, if you're offered a position, here's the thing. If you're offered a position, you have to ask these couple of things. And again, these are three questions that I like to, 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 to make sure. All right, you got offered a position. It's maybe an unpaid internship, it was a full time job, whatever, right? A couple of things. Number one, uh, did you, do you know the salary, right? You know the salary. You know how much it's going to pay, right? Um, you know where it's at. You know where it's located. You know it's across the country, right? You know that before you even apply. Now you got offered a job. Those factors are still the same. And, um, you know, the only other question is you thought the, the, you know, the responsibilities were this, but after the interview they said, well, no, you're going to be in charge of this, this, this. That happened to me. I've taken a position where I say, okay, you're also teaching classes too when you have a full course load. And I was like, I didn't know that. Or, you know, so I've, we've been in that situation before. But if you ask those three things, first, especially the first two, you can't, if they offer a position, you have to say yes. Because, again, these are the things you already know. I've had that situation before. I've had, we have GAs that, that end up quitting a position because, why well, just, it's not enough money. Well, you took it, you knew how much money it was when you took the job. So why is it different now? Sometimes it's pressure from family, sometimes it's just okay. A lot of times, and again, I don't know who said it, and I apologize, but we get disappointed in life when our, our expectations do not meet reality. What I thought it was gonna be like is not what it's like, and we get disappointed. So if those three things, if it is exactly what you thought it was gonna be, and they didn't move the university, and the pay is the same, you get offered a job, pretty much gotta take it. Because again, my good friend Sean Grudwell said, again, the more positions, the more opportunities you pass up, the more we're going to pass you up in the long run. So again, uh, make sure if you're going to say no, make sure you have a right reason to say no. Well, I just can't make it happen financially. Well, why? You knew that, right? You knew that. Unless they tell you the salary during the interview, right, then obviously that's the situation. And I've been in that situation where like, I didn't know it was that little. Um, but again, that's just one of those things. I've taken jobs for, I've taken full-time positions for, what is that? Oh. I've taken full-time positions for 18 grand and move uh, my family across the country for $18,000 a year. So believe me, I understand, uh, I understand by sacrifice. So um, let's finish up with this. And again, any questions you have on this, I'm sorry, we, we had some issues with, uh, with technology here and just using a remote uh, iPhone to do this. Again, when we do these in the future, we're going to be doing some different locations and, and come up with a little bit better feasible, uh, feasible alternative. So uh, the bottom line is, again, make sure you know what you get into. Uh, make sure that you understand the road you have in front of you. And, um, you know, it's one of those, it can happen. It, 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 this, this profession will, will, will chew you up and spit you out if you don't have the fortitude to keep, keep going with it. And if you're true to who, what you believe in as a person, and if you're in it for the right reasons, if you're in, if you're becoming a strength and conditioning coach because you love to coach, 
right? I love college strength edition, the best job in the world, right? That that age group is really what I feel is is is, is somewhere I can connect with. You know, strength and conditioning is is an awesome profession because there's no bullshit, there's no lying. It's you know, again, 100 pounds, is 100 pounds for you, for me, five years ago, 10 years from now, it's still 100 pounds, right? It's just, you know, just like the, just like the quote. Um, and and really, you know, there's no line. The stopwatch doesn't lie. Uh, you can't if you have the lowest vertical on a team, you have the lowest vertical on the team. It's like one of those spot, stopwatch sports, like swimming or track and field. Uh, there's no BS about it. And then coaching is, is like Nick Saban says, coaching is teaching. And, and, and you know, you know, teaching is just motivating people how to learn. So it's one of those, one of those very rewarding professions uh, if you can get through and really separate yourself from other people. If you have questions, again, we'll have uh, a question and answer on the article uh, portion of this video. And, uh, and again, you can, if all your strength and conditioning needs is contact us at leadfts.com. We'll help you out any way you can. So again, uh, don't forget uh, any of our articles or to comment on this article, go to uh, leadfts.com backslash categories backslash education. So thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Uh, and we'll see you next time uh, when we do a different subject.